Loyalty Binds Me, The Life of King Richard III, Part 3. The York brothers boarded their ships on the 2nd of March, 1471, surrounded by Flemish gunners, German and Dutch mercenaries, and the Englishmen who had joined Edward in exile. Adverse winds kept them in port for nine days, contemplating their future. The same problems were keeping Margaret of Anjou's ships in port further along the coast, preventing her from taking her son to join the resurgent Lancastrian cause. Edward, Richard and their fleet finally left port on the 11th of March, sailing into an unknown adventure and Richard's first experiences of the brutality of battle. The plan had been to land at Cromer in Norfolk, territory under the control of the friendly John Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, and Edward's brother-in-law, John de la Pole, Duke of Suffolk. But Mowbray was in custody, de la Pole stayed characteristically out of it, and Warwick had put Edward's mortal enemy, the Earl of Oxford, in charge of the region. When it became clear that they couldn't make port there, they pushed on north through the raging storms. Tuesday the 13th and Wednesday the 14th were spent enduring a battering off the east coast as the small fleet was eventually scattered. Edward landed at Ravenspur, coincidentally the very same spot on which Henry IV had landed in 1399 when he had deposed Richard II. Richard's ship finally came to ground four miles away from his brother. He and the 300 men with him set about finding their way back to the king. By the end of Thursday the 15th of March, they were all together again and their fledgling campaign could finally get underway. Despite the presence of the city from which the House of York took its name, the northeast was traditionally a Lancastrian region, and to the north of them was Warwick's heartland, where he could call on thousands of men. Few soldiers dripped into Edward's camp in response to his arrival, while scouts reported that large numbers of men were in harness, preparing to resist them. The one thing that seemed to keep them from attacking Edward was a residue of sympathy for his father, a man still widely loved in the region. Edward picked up on some sympathy for an attempt to reclaim his family's dukedom, and he played up to it, offering assurances that he had no desire to become king again, only Duke of York. The march south was slow and hard, with no more than a handful joining the Yorkist cause, yet still no one attacked them. Even when they passed by John Neville, Warwick's brother, at Pontefract Castle, they remained unchallenged. Perhaps Edward's dubious assertions of his aims had worked, or his martial reputation frightened men who still remembered the ferocious victor of the bloody Battle of Towton a decade earlier. Whatever the reason, they moved into friendlier territory in the Midlands, and Edward shed his pretense. He was back, and he wanted his crown. A piece of diplomacy, begun as soon as Edward had left England, now matured. George had found himself in a far worse position than he had hoped, and the House of York had come together to try and persuade the wayward brother to return to the fold. Mom Cecily and sisters Anne and Elizabeth had been working on George along with the Archbishop of Canterbury and Robert Stillington, the Bishop of Bath and Wells. Margaret, the sister who had grown up with George and Richard, was given special mention for having worked particularly hard. As George approached with several thousand men, Edward set out his army for battle outside Banbury in Oxfordshire. The women of the family had done their part, but could not be at a potential battlefield. Edward would surely say anything to negate the threat George posed, but there was one person who the wayward York brother might trust. The writer of the arrival of King Edward IV is clear that it was Richard who sealed the deal. He went to George and assured him that he would be safe and forgiven if he would come back into the fold. After the two had met, the armies watched as Edward and George strode out to the halfway point between them and embraced each other. Together, the three brothers moved south. Unable to lure Warwick out to give battle, they reached London on the 11th of April, let into the city by the recorder Thomas Erswick, after he'd sent those on watch to their dinner. George Neville, Archbishop of York and Warwick's brother, presented the bemused King Henry VI to Edward and the Lancastrian King, deposed for a second time, was returned to the tower. Edward went to Westminster Abbey to be reunited with his wife and daughters and to meet his new son, named for him, who had been born while he was in exile. There was little time for relaxation though. Having met his new heir, Edward, George and Richard prepared to march out again to end opposition once and for all. Warwick was finally, belatedly, marching south towards the capital. On the 13th of April, just two days after arriving in London, 
the Yorkist forces marched back out of the city to meet the Earl. Scouts from each army ran into each other near Barnet, just 10 miles north of London. As darkness fell, Warwick ordered his cannons to open fire at Edward, but in the gloom they'd camped closer to each other than they realised. Edward kept his men and cannon quiet all night as Warwick's gunstones blazed overhead, landing harmlessly behind them. As morning broke, Richard knew he was about to get his first taste of battle at the age of 18. Excitement mixed with fear and tension. He prepared for this moment for years, not allowing his scoliosis to restrict him. Warfare was still undertaken in line with the writings of Vegetius in his De Re Militari, a 5th century treatise on the successes and failures of the Roman Empire that sought out best practice and was still the accepted military textbook a thousand years later. Battle was to be avoided as risky and unpredictable, but if armies had to fight, they were laid out in three groups, called battles. The vanguard would be the forward unit, or would take the right wing if the battles lined up beside each other. The van would usually give battle first. The centre was usually the largest part of the army, and unsurprisingly took the middle ground. The rear guard would protect the army's back and provide reinforcements as required, taking the left wing if the battles were arranged beside each other. The armies prepared to fight on Sunday the 14th of April 1471, Easter Sunday. In an astounding display of confidence, Edward handed command of the vanguard on the right wing to his youngest brother Richard. Edward would have the centre and George would, perhaps unsurprisingly, remain where he could be watched. Lord Hastings would take the left wing. Numbers engaging in battles are notoriously hard to work out with confidence and even contemporary sources can be prone to exaggeration. One chronicle gives Edward 7,000 men and Warwick 10,000. Warwick held his centre with his brother John. His vanguard was under the command of John de Vere, 13th Earl of Oxford, and the rear guard on Warwick's left was given to Henry Holland, Duke of Exeter. The sources all agree that a thick fog clung to the grass in the early morning. Sometime between four and five in the morning, Edward's trumpet sounded and his guns opened fire. Warwick responded by unleashing his own cannon. In the dawn fog, the armies had lined up off-centre and closer to each other than they meant to. The Yorkist right, where Richard was, overlapped Exeter's wing so that Richard found his going relatively easy, flanking Exeter and pushing him back. The fighting in the centre was intense and evenly matched. On Edward's left, Hastings found himself outflanked by Oxford and Hastings' battle was quickly put to flight. Oxford's men, assuming the battle was won, gave chase right into Barnet and fell to looting. Some of Hastings' men kept running all the way to London, where they spread word that the battle was lost. When Oxford's men returned, the fog played another critical role. Oxford's badge of a star and streamers was mistaken by Warwick's men for Edward's son in splendour. When Warwick's men attacked Oxford's, a cry of betrayal went up and Warwick's entire army fell into panic and fled. Warwick was killed in the retreat, along with his brother John. Richard had endured his first medieval battle. He'd led the vanguard and been on the winning side, though he perhaps had an easier time than he might have under other circumstances. He'd helped his brother win the battle, but he'd lost his cousin and former mentor, family and friendship torn apart by the crown. It's hard to work out how he might have felt about the conflicting emotions. One thing for certain is that he was in pain. A newsletter written to the continent by Gerhard von Wessel noted that the Duke of Gloucester and Lord Scales were severely wounded, but they had no lasting harm from it, God be praised. There's no indication of what the injury was, but I wonder whether Richard might have lost the tip of his little finger on his right hand. The portrait in the National Portrait Gallery shows him covering what looks like a shortened finger with his thumb. It's an intriguing possibility and would fit with the idea of a wound that appeared worse than it turned out to be. Lord Scales, who was Anthony Woodville, the Queen's brother, was apparently unable to make the next campaign, but Richard recovered quickly enough, or was keen enough to take part, to make the next march. Two days after Barnet, word arrived that Margaret of Anjou and her son Edward, the Lancastrian Prince of Wales, had landed in the southwest on the same day as the battle. On the 24th of April, ten days after his first taste of war, Richard was at Windsor to join his brother's muster and march out again to meet the next, perhaps final, threat to Yorkist authority. 
as a hot, dry May baked the earth and the men encased in their heavy metal armour, the Yorkists shadowed the Lancastrian army along the Welsh border, managing to prevent them crossing the river into Wales at Gloucester and catching up to them at the next crossing at Tewkesbury, as night fell on the 3rd of May after a draining 30-mile march. As morning broke on the 4th of May, a battle was inevitable. Margaret had taken the doubtless hard but perhaps unavoidable decision to allow her 17-year-old son to take part in the fighting. He would be in the centre, which was under the command of Lord Wenlock. The Duke of Somerset, Edmund Beaufort, took the vanguard and the Earl of Devon, the rearguard. Edward took his own centre once more, with Richard rewarded for his previous performance with command of the vanguard again, and Hastings given the rear once more. With a blast of trumpets, King Edward placed the outcome of the battle into the hands of God and the Virgin Mary and ordered the attack. An artillery exchange began the engagement, but the Lancastrians were seriously outgunned. Somerset realised he couldn't just hold his ground, so went on the offensive. The Duke tried to get at Edward's centre, but was flanked and forced back towards Richard's vanguard. They soon broke and fled, many drowning in the river under the weight of their armour, as others tried to take sanctuary in the nearby abbey. The battle had been a close-run thing for a long time, but Edward was once more victorious with the help of his youngest brother. The king burst into the abbey, determined to remove those seeking safety there. It was a brave brother of the abbey who confronted the huge king, who held a drawn sword in his hand, and reprimanded the king, demanding pardons for those within. Edward agreed, but then had the men removed from the abbey anyway to face a court of chivalry convened under Richard as Constable of England again. Somerset and others were beheaded in Tewkesbury on the 6th of May, crushing Lancastrian resistance. One of the earliest acts of vicious murder attributed to Richard was the death of Prince Edward, the 17-year-old Lancastrian Prince of Wales, who died at the Battle of Tewkesbury. Prince Edward's death effectively ended the future of the House of Lancaster. Shakespeare's history plays have the prince brought before the York brothers. When the lad berates them, King Edward stabs him before Richard adds his dagger and then George a third. Richard then enthusiastically offers to kill Queen Margaret before he's stopped by the King. Shakespeare is clearly laying the groundwork for his ultimate villain. Hollinshed's Chronicle, published in 1577 and a source used by Shakespeare, has King Edward striking the lad before George, Richard, Thomas Grey and Lord Hastings kill him. Polydor Virgil's account, written at the behest of King Henry VII around 1513, but not published until 1534, has Edward arguing with the prince and shoving him before George, Richard and Lord Hastings slay him. No contemporary source implicates Richard at all. The arrival offers only that Prince Edward was caught while fleeing and slain during the battle. Walkworth wrote that the prince was killed in the field while calling to his brother-in-law George for succour. The Crowland Chronicler cryptically offers that the prince was killed by the avenging hands of certain persons but offers no names. He was quick to criticise Richard when he wrote in 1486, so would not be protecting him. Sympathetic to Edward, the writer may have sought to shield him, and George is perhaps the most likely candidate for looking to deliver a mortal blow. George had seen his prospects severely reduced by Warwick's settlement with the Lancastrians, but remained heir to Henry VI should his line fail. With his only son dead, it made George the Lancastrian heir to the throne. Still though, there's no real reason to believe Prince Edward was anything other than a casualty of the brutal battle. Richard's life up to the age of 18 had been rocked by the civil strife that gripped the country. He was born into a nation on the verge of tearing itself apart, to a father becoming the enemy of the king. At seven, he felt the soaring heights and crushing weights of fortune's wheel. Thrilled by the preparations at Ludlow, he quickly found himself abandoned to a marauding army by all the adult men of his family. The following year, he became a royal prince, the youngest son of the heir to the throne, only to find himself robbed of a father and forced into lonely exile with his brother George. From there, he'd become the brother to the king, second in line to the throne, and had trained to become a knight and a successful nobleman under one of the most powerful and famous men in medieval England, in his cousin Warwick. By the close of the 1460s, Warwick had fallen out with Edward spectacularly. The king had appeared to fend off the threat only for George to join the plotting, Warwick to form an unlikely pact with the Lancastrian Queen, and Richard to be driven into a second spell of exile. 
His return had seen his first two tastes of the brutal realities of battle. The first, at Barnet, had seen victory, serious injury, and the death of his former mentor, Warwick. The second had seen the only Lancastrian prince killed and men dragged from an abbey to face the executioner's block, judged to their deaths by the 18-year-old Richard. It might seem like a lot, and it surely was, but it was nothing compared to the years that were to follow. A hugely successful career as a royal duke, a summer of mysterious and earth-shattering upheavals, and a brief kingship awaited this young man. There was much behind him, but so much more to come.